morning. So glad to see you all this morning. Glad you are with us. I'm Reverend Christy Hollifield, and I'm one of the ministers here at First Baptist Waynesville. We are glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning and worship together. We continue our sermon series, Chaos on the Edge, and this morning we're going to be talking about the most important thing. We're going to be talking about love. We hope that you will enjoy this message this morning and be able to take this word with you as you go out throughout the week. If you are a visitor with us, please complete the visitor information tab. It's located inside your bulletin. There is a QR code um, that you can also take a picture of and fill out information about yourself that way as well. If you choose to uh, use the actual paper copy, if you will detach it once you've completed it and put it in one of the offering boxes, we have one at the back of the sanctuary and we have two up here beside each one of these doors. We would love to get to know more about you and plug you into different things we have going on in the church. And then also, after our worship this morning, if you will exit through these doors and head across the hall to our Connections Coffee House, we have coffee and sweet treats and a wonderful time of fellowship before we head to our small group sessions. If you um, are not sure of which small group to plug into, you can ask one of us. But there's also a list on the bulletin board beside the door heading into Connections Coffee House, and you can look at all the different options that are there as well. It is wonderful to be in the house of the Lord with you all this morning. Let us join now in prayer so we can begin worship together. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful day. We thank you for the love that you have for us, the love that you demonstrate for us daily. Lord, I pray that the words that we hear this morning will touch us deeply so that we can better learn how to love ourselves and how to learn and learn how to love others around us more deeply, impactfully, and more like you. It is in your precious and holy name that we ask these things. Amen. This morning, uh, everybody's trying to get in their last summer fling. So our actually our band has kind of had too many folks out this morning. So later in the service where it says 100 South Main, uh, we'll be singing some hymns and stuff like that. So, but don't worry about it, they'll be back next week. So I just wanted to let you know. If you will now take your hymnal and turn to hymn number 14, praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Stand with me as we sing, hymn number 14.
morning. I'm going to be reading from Jeremiah 31, verses 3 through 10. The Lord appeared to us in the past, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. I will build you up again, and you, virgin Israel, will be rebuilt. Again, you will take up your timbrels and go out to dance with the joyful. Again, you will plant vineyards on the hills of Samaria. The farmers will plant them and enjoy their fruit. There will be a day when watchmen cry out on the hills of Ephraim, Come, let us go up to Zion, to the Lord our God. This is what the Lord says. Sing with joy for Jacob. Shout for the foremost of the nations. Make your praises heard and say, Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I will bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the ends of the earth. Among them will be the blind and the lame, expectant mothers and women in labor. A great throng will return. They will come with weeping. They will pray as I bring them back. I will lead them beside streams of water on a level path where they will not stumble. Because I am Israel's father and Ephraim is my firstborn son. Hear the word of the Lord, you nations. Proclaim it in distant coastlands. He who scattered Israel will gather them and will watch over his flock like a shepherd. Let's pray. God, thank you for being an everlasting, loving presence in our lives. When things feel scattered, when we are not sure where we're going, we know that you do, and that is a comfort. We love you so much. Amen.
children may come for children's sermon. Good morning, my friends. I am glad to have you with me today. I've missed seeing your smiling faces. Glad you're here. So today, we are talking about something that is so very important. And that thing is love. God created the world, right? Because he loves us and he wants to be with us. He sent his son Jesus because he loves us, right? And he wanted us to be with Jesus, to learn from him. Jesus died on the cross because he loves us. A love that we can't really put into words. But Jesus did give us a definition. So let me read you what love is and is not. And this is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8. I'm sorry, verse 4. It starts at verse 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous or envious. It doesn't boast and be proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It doesn't anger easily. And it keeps no records of rights or wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices in the truth. Love always protects. It always trusts. And it always hopes and perseveres. It never fails. It never goes away. That is God's love, isn't it? He's given us that definition. And everywhere in the Bible, all the stories that we read, we see that love. Example after example after example of God's love for us, of Jesus' love for us. So we can learn from this how to love others, how to love ourselves, and be true love. Let's pray, okay? Can we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. The love that fills every page, we thank you for. We thank you for the example of love that you show to us daily. Help us to see it, Lord, to take it into us, to love ourselves in that way, and to love others that we come into contact with that way. So that when they look, they see nothing but your love. In your precious name we pray. Amen. This morning we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, often called uh, the love chapter. In the chapter that precedes that, Paul is talking about spiritual gifts and the importance of how we use gifts in the church for the building up of the church, but how every part is important. Everybody's gift is important. Not one thing is above the other. And he actually ends that chapter by saying, seek the greater gifts and I will show you a more excellent way. And then he goes into what we call the love chapter. And this morning as I was thinking about that, I was thinking about how that what Paul says in chapter 13 is what binds everything else together. It what binds us, it makes, it binds us together in our spiritual gifts and in our mission. And it teaches us that not only do we love each other as a congregation, but that love is supposed to move beyond and to all followers of Christ. But it's even greater than that, that God's love and the way God's love works through us is what underpins our witness in the world. It's, it what make, it's what makes the good news true when we proclaim it, by the love that we live out both with each other, but the love that we live out in the world. So if you will join me in singing hymn number 389, to worship, work, and witness, the good news spread abroad. Stand with me as we sing. <laughs>
great to see all of you here today. We do have a lot getting in that last uh, summer fling, but we're glad you're here today and welcome you to our worship service. And before we worship the Lord in the Word, let's pray together. Father, we are grateful for this day, grateful for your blessings, grateful for this time together. And now, God, as your people, we pause and we listen for your voice. Help us, God, to hear you and what you want us to to hear and to know today and to live by. We do pray for those many who are traveling this weekend that you would watch over them and bring them home to us safely. We also pray for those who are suffering and going through difficult times today in places like Ukraine and other spots. And God, help us to keep them in our hearts as we worship together, particularly those congregations who gather in your name in those places. And now, God, we pray that humbly that you would speak to us and bless us in this time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please take your Bible and turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians. And our text is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Beginning actually with part of verse 31, but beginning technically with verse 1. There it's written. And yet I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. Not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does, not, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. In our worship unit, Chaos on the Edge, We've been thinking about what it means to be the church today in a culture that doesn't support our values, basically an unchurched culture. How do we function? How do we relate to that? And we've, we've been exploring that through the book of 1 Corinthians. Surely a church in an unchurched culture trying to uphold the values of Christ and trying to share the good news in that culture. Part of our challenge as the church is to relate to our culture with love, to show our love to the people of the culture. Sadly, particularly in the unchurched culture, the last word people use to describe us is love. We are not known as a loving people, particularly among those who don't go to church. You might ask, well, who cares what the unchurched think? They're unchurched, they're lost, they're pagans. Who cares what they believe? Well, God seems to care because when we read the scriptures, the Apostle Paul especially is concerned about how 
how the world looks at the church in terms of its love, in terms of its ethical quality, in terms of how people relate to each other. These are all important to Paul. And therefore, I think they must be important to God as well, for the Lord inspired him to write these things. So with that in mind, we're going to explore this great love chapter this morning for a few moments. And as we do so, I believe we're going to see that we should love others as God loves in the way that God loves them particularly. That we imitate God's love as we relate to each other within the church, but also as we relate to the people around us. Now, as we've gone through 1 Corinthians, we've seen Paul deal with all kinds of conflicts and problems and struggles. And one of those concerns spiritual gifts, which Rebecca Mathis spoke of weeks ago. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul begins this section, this particular part of Corinthians, by talking about those spiritual gifts. And he was telling them that all the gifts were important. It seems that the Corinthians, being the human beings they were, like all human beings, were attracted to the spiritual gifts that were most showy, that brought the most attention. Gifts like speaking in tongues, gifts like doing miraculous stuff. So they were hung up on these showy gifts, but Paul said all the gifts are important. Every every gift needs to be expressed in the church. He used the analogy of the human body saying, for example, I can't say the, the I cannot say the foot, I don't need you, you know. Everything's important, foot, hand, eye, everything. So all these gifts are Important In chapter 14, Paul will return to that subject and we'll take that up next year. He'll go back to worship and the expression of spiritual gifts. But sandwiched right in between there, between 12 and 14, is this 13th chapter, this great expression about love. To me, it's like Paul is in this pitched battle. He's in this intense battle dealing with all this stuff. And sometimes in church, we can get so involved in dealing with all this stuff that we can't see the forest for the trees. You know, we're we're, we're overwhelmed with it all. And it's like right in the middle of that, God lifts Paul up to this high level where the big picture comes in. Where everything falls into perspective. And how and we have this remarkable, beautiful love chapter that is in many ways poetry. It doesn't come across so much in English. So I'm going to try to show you this morning in Greek how it is so poetic. But, but, it, but it, it, it's this uplifted vision and language that takes us to a new and greater level. As I mentioned When I was reading the text, Paul's thought really begins at the end of chapter 12. As after talking about all these spiritual gifts, he says, now I'm going to show you the greatest thing, the most excellent way. What you should really be focusing on. And I'm going to I'm going to show you something important that gives meaning to everything else. That gives direction to everything else I'm talking about. And so in verses 1 to 3, Paul reaches for something higher, greater, and more important than what he's talked about before. Again, he's going up to this higher level. So again, in verses 1 to 3, Paul pressed beyond spiritual gifts, went past those to the motivating and directing force behind them. What motivated those gifts? What directed them? Why were they expressed to begin with? How did it all fit, how did it all fit in the big picture? And Paul will say that, that the thing that drove it all, the, the, the motivating and directing force, 
was what he called agape. Agape. Now, most, uh, really all English versions translate this word as love. We'll, we'll talk about why this, is, this isn't adequate, why it, it doesn't really communicate what Paul's talking about. Most of you know that there are three main Greek words for love. Uh, one, of the, one of our issues is that uh, English is like color. Greek is like technicolor 3D. Sort of, you know, it, it goes beyond what we can talk about. We have one word for love. And we use it to describe every feeling we have from our feelings for God to our feelings for ice cream and little baby ducks and pickup trucks. Remember Tom T. Hall? Yeah, some of you remember that. We use the same word to describe all of that. And so it's this big, loose term that expresses this kind of sometimes fuzzy feeling of affection we have for things. But Greek had, actually had probably like six or seven words, but three main words. The first was eros, from which we get our word erotic, which refers to sexual, physical attraction kind of love, romantic love. The second is philia, which is more of a brotherly love. You know, we have Philadelphia, uh, which, which comes from ancient Philadelphia in the scriptures. Love for a brother, there's a whole story for that. But kind of a brotherly love, affection. And then there's this third word, which is, which can, which you can hardly find in Greek before the New Testament. And it appears God led Paul and the other writers of the New Testament to pick up this obscure word and give it this tremendous content. And the word was agape, the word that that God led them to use. And agape, in fact, we'll see where Paul gives content and meaning to agape in this chapter. And agape basically is the highest form of love you can imagine. And in many ways, agape, agape transcends all other kinds of love. And agape is a ma- more of a matter of will, in many ways, than emotion. For example, nobody can command you to eros somebody or to Phileo, 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 somebody. The reason why is it's either there or it isn't. You know, either you love somebody like a brother or sister, or you don't. You you just can't make that. You can't will that to happen. But agape comes from the will. Now, many times emotion will follow that will, but agape is more an act of the will. In agape, you will to care for somebody. You will to give to somebody. As this slide says, it goes beyond just the emotions, the extent of seeking the best for others. It's an act of the will. A good beginning understanding of it is in that great passage we love so much, John 3, 16. What does it say? It says, for God so agape the world that he gave his one-of-a-kind son. See how the link between agape and giving. God willed to agape the world, though it didn't agape him, by giving his son. Furthermore, agape is not tied to the attractiveness or the worthiness of the object. In other words, God didn't love us, he didn't love the world because he found it desirable or worthy of his love. He didn't do that. He agape the world because of his grace. So agape focuses not on the worthiness of the object, 
but the graciousness of the subject. God agape the world. Not because it was attractive or great or lovely or beautiful, but because of his grace. And out of that grace, he gave. So with that understanding of what agape is and how inadequate our word love is, we go forward with the chapter. Paul begins in these first three verses again to to give context and meaning to this this word agape. He said that if he spoke in human and angelic tongues, now that was one of the things that the Corinthians were hung up about, the gift of tongues. He says, if I spoke in human and angelic tongues, but didn't have agape, it would be just racket, a banging gong or clanging Symbol. Not that those can't be musical sometimes, but just wreck it, Paul says. He said, if I had the gift of prophecy, but didn't have love, it wouldn't mean anything. If he had a faith to move mountains and didn't have love, it would be nothing. In fact, in original language, Paul says, nothing I am. If I don't have agape in these wondrous, fantastic things. Paul went on to the stunning statement in verse three. If I gave everything I possess to the poor. And if even if I sacrificed my own body and didn't have love, I gained nothing. Didn't have agape. I gained nothing. That's how critical, fundamentally important Agape is to what we do. Paul said, even with all these wondrous, miraculous, fantastic things, if I don't have love, I am nothing and it means nothing. Oftentimes, we worry about what are the essentials of our faith? What's most important in our faith? What what are the most important practices in our faith? And I'm afraid sometimes in our conversation about that, we put all kinds of things up high. It's important for us to condemn sin. It's important for us to do this, do that. But so many times, the importance of loving, of agape, is way down the list. And yet Paul takes it to the top of the list. So did Jesus when you read Jesus. So the other writers of the New Testament, they take... Agape up to the highest level, but we slot it on down. Paul goes on in verses four to seven to give content to agape. What is agape like? And Paul tells us what agape is like. First, by using a couple of ises, then eight nots, and then four alwayses. Two is is eight nots and four always is. He starts off with two is is. Love is patient. Means keep keeps going forward, persistent. Love is kind. It's important. Then after that we have eight nots in, in original language. It reads not, 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 not. That's the poetic. You have is, is, and then not, 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 not. It it is not envious, not boastful, not proud. It does not dishonor others, others, not self-seeking, not easily angered, not keeping a record of wrongs, not delighting in evil, but rejoicing with the truth. That's how it reads in the original language. It is not these things. It does not have these qualities. And then he goes on to the four always. He says it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. So when you put these is's, nots, and always together, you have a composite picture of what agape 
looks like? What are its qualities? What, how do we define it? And so this is what agape is for Paul. And then in verses 8 to 13, he goes to the transcending and enduring qualities of agape, adding to the importance of agape love in our lives. He says, first of all, love never fails. Agape never fails. This doesn't mean that we never fail to agape. We often fail to agape. But agape itself never fails. It never ends. Paul here takes us to the end of all things when the last acts of of God have taken place in history, when he ends this world. He says, at the end of all things, where there are prophecies, they will cease. In the eternal kingdom, what need will we have for prophecy? None, because we'll be right there with God, direct communication. Where there are tongues, there'll be what, what, what will we need that for? We'll have perfect communication with God. Where there is knowledge, we'll all know God, Paul will say in a moment. So we don't need these special gifts. And then he says in verse 9, he says, For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the completeness comes, what is in part disappears. I find it Greatly comforting that even Paul himself did not know everything. He says, there's stuff I don't know. He certainly had convictions and persuasions and faith, but he didn't know everything. And so Paul says, I I don't know everything. I don't have all this knowledge. But he says, when the complete comes, and your version may say, the perfect comes. What, what, What that word really means is, when everything is fulfilled, when it's complete, everything is fully as it ought to be, the in part disappears because we're whole. Everything is as it should be. He goes on from there to use two images to describe our final sort of transformation at the end of all things. First is that childhood. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. I I saw life, and it's not a bad thing. It's just a child. Child sees things a certain way from a certain perspective, from a perspective of immaturity and selfishness many times. But that's how a child sees things. But when I became a man, he says, I put the ways of childhood behind me. I had a different perspective. And so he says, when we go to be with God, we'll have a different perspective. We'll see things differently. We'll see things from his perspective. I know if you're like me, you've got a lot of questions for God when you get to heaven. A lot of things you would like to know. But Paul says, we'll know them. We'll be there. You know, the perfect will come. We'll be complete. And we'll see things from God's perspective, which we have been unable to see hitheretofore. And then he uses, um, uh, going beyond that analogy, he goes on to talk about the analogy of the mirror. He says, he says, verse 12, now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Now, When we think of a mirror, we think of one thing, but in Paul's day, they thought of something else. Actually, their mirrors were like polished pieces of metal. That's a picture of one. And if you look at that, you can barely kind of make out the image of of, of a person in there. (coughs) So I love this analogy. Paul says, it's like today we're holding this mirror and God is standing behind us and we're, we're, you know, manipulating it around trying to make out the features, trying to understand. And and the word Paul uses for uh, distortion, or the the word he used to describe this image, is the root for our word enigma. Enigma. And I can't think of many ways of of, of a better word to describe 
how God can appear to us many times as an enigma, as a riddle, as something we don't completely or fully understand. So we're here with this mirror trying to make out God. And then Paul says, we'll turn around and we'll be face to face. Then we'll see face to face. And I will know God as fully as he has known me. That's a striking statement. I will know God as fully as he has known me. And what a shift of perspective that will be. And then in verse 13, he closes out by saying, and now at the end of the day, as we look at life and anticipate eternity, these three remain, faith, hope, and agape. And the greatest of these, he says, is agape. Why? Will we need faith in the eternal kingdom? Will we need hope in the eternal kingdom? But we will still have agape. Why? Because you may remember when we uh, studied the Trinity months ago, we said that within the Trinity, God shares eternal agape. Eternal agape. So in eternity, we'll be sharing the eternal agape of the Trinity. We'll be sharing it together as his people with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The greatest of these is agape. In reflecting on this, I believe that living in this agape is the greatest thing about our faith. It's the highest point of our faith. But at the same time, it's the most difficult thing about our faith. It's the hardest thing about our faith. It seems sometimes we'd rather do anything else than agape each other and the world because it's so hard. It's so difficult. Hate is natural. Jealousy is natural. Wanting to stomp on others to get where you want to go is natural. Agape is not. It's something that that we struggle with. Now, this doesn't mean we don't see great manifestations of agape. And we can point out many great manifestations of agape in and through Christ's church. Um, I'm excited that uh, Jay Brantley's parents are here this morning. We welcome you guys. We just returned from mission trip, and I didn't know you guys were going to be here, but, but to me, they gave us great examples of agape love. Here's a picture of Jay sharing with a group of the Samburu men that we saw and we were part of. It doesn't capture the howling wind and all that, but um, there is Jay teaching the Bible to the Samburu men, and here is Sumter doing the same with the women. And I was so struck by the agape love, the will to go and love these people in this remote place in Kenya to unselfishly go and to share Christ's love there, to make all those sacrifices, to go and do that. Why? And that's a great demonstration of agape. Also, I think uh, this past year we did a a study of uh, John Lewis's life, the great uh, civil rights figure. Here's a picture of Lewis getting beaten uh, at the Pettus Bridge uh, in Alabama back during that struggle. He was almost killed there. He's there on the ground being beaten for doing nothing more than peacefully protesting. And Lewis wrote that before they did these things, they went to training and they learned to work on practicing agape even against those who beat them. To to love them in Christ's name. To not hate those who beat them and jail them. Because to yield to hate would nullify their relationships with God and the high goals they were seeking to achieve. 
To me, that was remarkable. That was amazing. Sadly to me, such manifestations of love are far too rare within the church today or even the church in past history. Many of you have heard this quote from Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi said, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. What do you think he was talking about there? I think he was talking about he saw agape in Christ. But he didn't see so much agape among Christians, Christ followers. I would say agape not just to outsiders, but also agape within the church. The refusal of church people to practice agape, even today, is evident everywhere in America, in our own country. I know you, like me, must have had to have been disheartened when during the January 6th riots, you see people waving Christian flags in there and, and, and posters saying Jesus saves, engaging in violence, beating up captive police officers. And, and you wonder, where is the agape here? Christians yelling and screaming at school board meetings, social media posts by pastors and church leaders that are just hateful and unloving. No agape there. It's no wonder so many people that today say your Christians are so unlike your Christ. They don't reflect them. Now, my pastoral side says, yeah, but it's so hard. It is so hard to agape. And I, I, I struggle with it. And I know you struggle with it. It is so hard to agape. It's beyond our natural ability to do. It is not natural to us to behave in that way. But my prophetic side says to me, it's difficult, but we must practice agape. Otherwise, everything we do means nothing without it. And I'm not saying that. Paul said that. If we don't have agape, it means nothing. It doesn't matter how big your church is, how packed it is, how much money it takes in, how big it build, its buildings are. If it doesn't have agape, it is nothing. That's what Paul said. Now, no person other than Jesus has ever lived in perfect agape. I don't know anybody. Uh, I know Jay and Sumter are not perfect. John Lewis certainly was not perfect. All these other people, not perfect. No one's ever lived in perfect agape. So why try to attain something we never can attain? Why reach for it when we never can get it? Well, I believe we need to keep reaching for it because one, God commands us to do it. To keep reaching for it. And even though we reach for it and know that we'll never attain it, in the reaching for it, we are transformed and we come closer to it. I believe in the constant reaching for that agape, we are transformed to be more like God in his agape. As hard as it is, as challenging as it is, as discouraging as it can be, even within our own selves, we're to keep reaching for that agape. How can you reach for that agape? How can you do that? Well, first, I think the beginning point, for me anyway, is to think about how much agape God has shown you. How much agape has God shown you? Um, God's agape for you is, is based on you. God loves you as you are. God doesn't agape you because of what you could be, but because of who you are. God loves you as you are in all your sinfulness and all your brokenness and all your failure. God still loves you. He wills to care. So meditate on the, how much God lo love God has shown you. And that, to me, that puts things in a totally different perspective. Second, meditate on how you can show God's measure of agape to other people. First, here in the church. How can you show God's measure of agape to each other here? 
But also continue with those outside the church, those out in the community. Even people you don't like, you know, even people on the opposite side of the political spectrum from you or have awful lifestyles or whoever you, you have a hard time loving, ask God to give you the power to agape them, to care for them. And then finally, put it into, put it into practice. Again, agape is an act of the will at last. If you ever... If, if you wait until God gives you the feeling of love, it's not going to happen. Instead, you must will and go forward to show the agape for it to happen in life. So next time you're tempted to hate somebody, either inside or outside the church, remember how much agape God has shown you. Remember how much forgiveness God has shown you and then use that same measure with others. Finally, remember those great words. In the end, these three are the greatest things, faith, hope, and agape. And the greatest of these is agape. Let's pray. This morning, if you've never experienced this love of God for yourself, we invite you to know it, to receive it. We invite you to follow Christ yourself, if you've never done that before. In a moment, we're going to sing a hymn of commitment and invite you to follow Jesus. I'll be standing here at the front and we'll be glad to share with you how you can do that. Or I'd be glad to speak to you after the service. But whatever God is calling you to or speaking to you about, please respond during these moments. Dear Lord, we thank you for the deep and wonderful agape you have shown us. And Lord, help us to share that same agape with each other and with the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of response is hymn number 571. Let others see Jesus in you. Please stand with me as we sing hymn number 571.
Again, it's great to see everybody here today. Uh, before I do announcements, I do want to announce, have a good announcement. Uh, we have some newlyweds today. Pat and Joe Conard are celebrating their 46th anniversary. Joe surely robbed the cradle, but we congratulate Joe and Pat today on a great anniversary. Um, also want to announce that our each year we provide breakfast for Waynesville Middle School teachers on their kind of in-service work day before school begins. This year that's going to take place a week from this Tuesday. That'll be August 16th at 7.30 a.m. There, there are about 90 staff members there at Waynesville Middle School. So we have a big breakfast to provide. So uh, Tracy Ferguson is looking for volunteers to make casseroles, muffins, breads, etc. for the annual staff breakfast. If you can help with that, please contact Tracy or contact the church office and we'll connect you with that. That's a great ministry. Uh, those teacher and staff at Waynesville Middle really appreciate that. Uh, and some of our own members teach over there. So uh, do please remember that uh, coming up. Also, you'll note in your bulletin, you have a list. This is preparing for our deacon nomination and election process. On that list are those who meet the general requirements for serving as a deacon. You'll have an opportunity on uh, the 21st of August to nominate uh, up to six to serve on our deacon body. So do be praying about that. That's coming up. Uh, in just a couple of weeks, but this list is a beginning towards that. Also, deacons, please remember you'll be meeting at five o'clock this afternoon. We invite all of you to join us for Connections Coffee House. Just go directly through these exit doors into our gym. We have coffees and coffees. We have coffee and goodies, and we'll be glad to connect you with a small group if you're not a part of one. I lead a group called Afterward, in which we reflect on today's worship service, and you would be welcome at that or to any other group. Again, we can help you with that. So now let's all stand together. I think I covered everything and um, let's be dismissed in prayer and then wait for our acolytes to come. And now may the grace and peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. May he guide you and bless you and fill you with his, his agape to over, fill you with agape to overflowing so you can show that same agape to others this week. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please remain while we wait for our acolytes. Thank you, you're dismissed.